My friends, Brazil is facing a war without a name. In late September, I met Rio de Janeiro's pickups operatives from CORE, which stands for Coordenadoria de Recursos Especiais, or in English, Coordination of Special Assets. The purpose of this elite battalion is to support law enforcement units of the civil police in complex and dangerous operations inside the city's favelas. I'm getting serious modern warfare favela map vibes. In this video, I tell you how they operate, the tactics they use, and the war of information led against them. For example, activists have pushed the Brazilian Supreme Court to limit police operations in the favelas. Contrary to expectations, holding back law enforcement has led to an increase of violence and where the Brazilian government has effectively lost control over entire parts of Rio de Janeiro to various criminal factions. Criminosos, bandidos, traficantes, vagabundos. Those are all the terms used by the police to describe the criminal factions they face. But notice how this enemy does not have a name. Reality is beyond the postcard city, Ipanema, Copacabana, Rio de Janeiro is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. 3,000 homicides in 2023, tens of thousands of heavily armed criminals, towering slums turned into fortresses, and that's where I went for you and for the very beautiful beaches. I realized how dangerous it was when I went in this favela and while hiking through the jungle near the favela of Hosinha, I heard the following. These special operations units of the police are necessary because the criminal factions are heavily armed and regular police forces are not enough. And let's be honest, they work in an environment with an extremely hostile population. Hence the word war. How many criminals do you know own military-grade weapons, RPGs, grenade launchers, machine guns? And they're growing bolder and bolder. They also have become experts in IDs and drones. They are now being trained in sophisticated guerrilla warfare tactics and follow the clear professional standards, even in command gestures. There's a reason why people started using the word narco-insurgents to describe these outlaws. Spoilers, during my visit, I asked one of the operatives of Kore, who teaches all these military techniques to the criminals? And then followed a very awkward silence. Okay, a very dark secret that no one dares to talk about, but that I will reveal to you towards the end. Long story short, the moment I posted my first picture on IG from Brazil, I got contacted by Alessandro Visacro a former colonel of the Brazilian army and author of multiple books on counterinsurgency. Alessandro slid into my DMs and asked me if I wanted to meet Fabricio Oliveira, the battalion commander of CORE. It's the sister unit of the very famous BOPI, which stands for Bataillon de Operations Policiais Especiais. They're part of the military police, whereas CORE is part of the civil police. Gotta thank Brazilian bureaucracy. And they often work hand in hand together. Bopi was notoriously portrayed in the movie Tropa de Elite. And you will rarely hear me say this, but 95% of what is depicted in the movie is accurate. I also wanted to thank all my Patreon supporters that allowed me to finance this trip abroad and create this exclusive content for you. September 29th. 9 a.m. Cidade da Polícia, the police headquarters of the city of Rio de Janeiro, to get there a 40-minute taxi ride through some of the most dangerous favelas, UPP police cars at every intersection. I could feel the scenery change and the taxi driver did not even dare stopping at red lights. That's when I met Delegado Fabricio Oliveira. And once again, I want to thank him for this opportunity, for inviting me into this very special battalion. He's been in the police for 20 years, and he's been the battalion commander of CORE for four years now. Let's say I'm glad I brushed up on my Portuguese before going there. Mas é muito bom você 
Not great, not terrible. Delegado Fabricio also told me about the history of his battalion and explained how Cori are always the first to enter a favela and the last to leave in order to secure the perimeter for regular police officers. At the entrance of their office, there is this huge logo, which I've been offered a miniature version of it as a souvenir. Their emblem is a falcon, strong, precise, and a true hunter by nature. The police station is positioned right between the favelas of Manguinhos and Jacarezinho. That's because the criminal factions in control of these favelas are not scared to face the police in open battle. Corre recently lost two operatives there in Jacarezinho, one in 2017 and another in 2021. During a raid that left 27 bandits, K.A. During that operation, the police converged into that favela from 70 entry points. At one point, the bandits were cornered and refused to surrender. So the operatives cleared the place using their own CQB tactic, renamed Entrada Corre. Currently, Delegado Fabricio told me that the most dangerous place is the Complexo do Alamão. In July 2022, the police fired as many as 4,000 shots in the first two hours alone during an operation against this favela. As you can imagine, being a police officer in Rio de Janeiro is dangerous. The stats speak for themselves. In 2023, 44 were reported KIA and another 56 severely injured, most of them part of the military police. Although that's down from an average of 100 KIA per year between 2016 and 2020. You might think it's because the city is getting safer, but in reality, the government simply reduced police operations against the favelas by 80%. Meanwhile, according to this article, areas controlled by armed groups in Rio grew 131% in 16 years. But at least it looks good on paper. So politicians can't get reelected. Whoops, spoilers! By the way, in Brazil, it's highly offensive to say favela. The politically correct term is comunidade or community. Just an example how wokeism has also spread throughout Brazilian society, where armed bandits are turned into the victims. For example, during the inauguration of the new Minister of Culture, a singer praised the narcos fighting the police. As a matter of fact, one week after I went there, on October 9th, 2023, 1,000 police officers raided three favelas, one of which is the famous Cidade de Deus. The fighting was so intense that two police helicopters were hit by gunfire and were forced to land. After I've been offered some delicious coffee and I said that I spoke French, Fabrizio told me, oh, there's a guy in my team that speaks French, come. I was a bit surprised, but I'm walking through the building and we reach a gym. Low-key, I was like, can I do a quick set? <laughs> in front of me, a dozen gladiators, late 30s, early 40s, all individually selected for their top-tier fitness skills, but also for their unbreakable minds. Kore has special recruitment methods to weed out elements that would be corrupt and accept bribes. One day, five Kore operatives arrested an important faction leader. He told them, I offer you 1 million reais each right now in cash and you let me go. The operatives laughed and brought him right to jail, right away. One of these gladiators stepped forward and presented himself in French. His name was Gabriel, callsign Lodge. During his military service, he spent one year in Brazil's paratroopers, an elite unit. A couple years later, around 2003-2004, he went to France and signed a five-year contract with the French Foreign Legion's 2nd Paratrooper Regiment. After returning to Brazil, he joined Corre as a sniper, and when I met him, it was his 13th year of service in the battalion. Lodge explained how one day during a firefight, he was hit by a huge bullet. It pierced him right under the armpit and left a huge hole in his back. Although he was hit, he was smiling because he had full trust in his teammates. Lodge knew that no matter what, he would be taken care of. And once he recovered, he simply went back to his unit. Apart from being an elite soldier, he's also a wingsuit world champion. Cody is composed of 300 personnel, but they have a very special structure. The first group is the Special Operations Unit. 60 operatives separated in four teams. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie and Delta. Charlie, 
il y a une maison là, qu'il y a, c'est pas, 10 mecs avec des fusils oui. dedans. C'est nous qui va rentrer là pour ah, l'arrêter. Ouais. Elle parle beaucoup bien français. <rire> His chef would last for 24 hours and they would rotate every four days. A full strength team is composed of eight men. It's important so they can push into the narrow alleyways of the favelas with a 2 4 2 formation. And a full strength patrol would be composed of two such combat teams. Lodge said, just like in football, it's not your individual skills that matter, the art is how you work together. Of course, a Brazilian had to make a reference to football. The Special Operations Unit is augmented by 50 regular operatives, whose purpose is to bring volume and bulk up patrols. As a team of specialists moves in for the frontal assault, the regulars are positioned on the flanks to make sure nobody gets through. Sometimes the role is just to sit in an armored vehicle in order to secure a specific crossroad. Kore also has a 50-man aerial operations unit, who use the battalion's helicopters plus an equal-sized platoon of sappers for demining and demolition duties. All in all, that's roughly 200 active personnel. On top of that, there are 9 to 5 office workers, the staff, the intelligence team, drone operators, and so on. And that's how we get to 300. Then Delegado Fabricio sat me down in a classroom. <laughs> oh, the nostalgia. The only thing missing was a teacher with a thick Indian accent. I was ready for a military-grade briefing. Sort of. Not really. It was a PowerPoint presentation. Essentially, there are three criminal factions that dominate the city of Rio de Janeiro. The Red Command, Comando Vermelho. The Third Pure Command, Terceiro Comando Puro. And Friends of Friends, Amigos dos Amigos. They finance their activities through substance trades, but they also collect taxes and impose special protection fees to local residents. They also rely on various robberies, like here when they assault a truck, or in this case, the ambush of an armored cash in transit vehicle. On top of that, 50% of the territory is controlled by the militia, former cops that turn to the dark side. To the extent that the militia is indistinguishable from Narcos. That man is the imposter. Although their army is smaller due to their alliance with factions Bonji di Zinho and Terceiro Comando Puro, they greatly expanded their control in the western flatlands of the city. The term coined by Visacro is a criminal insurgency because these armed groups, these factions, have no political ideology. They don't fight or offer a political alternative to the current one, but they function and are armed the same way as a guerrilla force. Another term would be narco guerrillas. In 2004, Stanislavski conceptualized the term black spot with the purpose of designating criminal enclaves around the world that are beyond effective government control. As you can imagine, the problem of fighting in such asymmetrical urban layouts is that the bandits know every corner of the favela. They've spent their entire lives there. Meanwhile, core operatives have to know the layout of all the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Favelas also come in all shapes of form. Some expand on the flatlands, but the ones that are the most difficult to operate on are built on hilltops, with the headquarters, other weapons and substance caches located near the top. It's literally like a castle, a fortress. In other words, Law enforcement will face an elaborate, structured, and robust defense system. In terms of intelligence gathering, the factions have miners working as informants for them round the clock, whose only job is to raise the alarm in case the police arrives. But nowadays, they supplement this with the heavy use of drones. Once police convoys are detected, the first thing the bandits do is to block the access of the favela with a series of barricades. In response, special operations units push through using their now infamous Maverick-type armored vehicles, nicknamed Caveirons, or Big Skulls. That alone lets everyone know they're not there to F around. Those are Maverick-type armored vehicles from South Africa. They're used as battering rams to break through the barricades, and they're made to sustain IEDs and heavy 50 cal fire. They're operated by two drivers with a capacity of 10 passengers, so it can fit an entire team of operatives and perhaps some arrested suspects. As you can notice, these vehicles do not have their own armament, but rather firing holes that allow personnel on board to use their individual weapons. Donc, si tu peux mettre les fusils, uh, fais comme ça. 
the one that was in felt pretty old and used up. A massive bullet impact in the windshield. But I've been told the government never finds the budget to repair this. So they go into battle with it just as it is. As a matter of fact, all the operatives from Kore have a second job to help them pay bills. And they use their own funds to pay for weapons, protection equipment, uniforms, and their latest drones. The criminal factions have implemented the construction of obstacles. Here are a couple of examples. As you can see, all of them can easily stop police cars from entering a favela. However, the most effective is using steel beams such as rail tracks. They're relatively cheap and easy to procure. The factions dig holes into the street, hold the train track up, and pour concrete into the hole. I can guarantee you no vehicle can easily break through this. Even the caverans will have trouble. More often than not, they only dig a small hole and then they can simply insert or remove the steel beams to let some of the cars through. I mean, it's cheap and effective. To obstruct security forces even more, they can dig a barrel into the road and then add the steel tracks and concrete. They do this so they can add these tires on top of each other and light them up using gasoline. The fire and smoke will prevent the police units from seeing beyond the barricade. As you can see in this video from October 2023, the entire line of sight is obstructed once the fire starts. Here's another setup from the favela of Salguero. The roadblock consists of four steel tracks with two barrels each dug into the ground. The first two at the front actually serve as a gate, which the bandits can open or close. Like we've seen previously, the purpose is to control the flow of vehicles and only allow residents of that specific favela in or out of the compound. Some of these gates even have pikes in front. Good luck charging your caveron against it. Once again, it's low tech but pretty sophisticated at the same time. This means the operatives often have to dismount and continue the operation on foot. As you can imagine, this leads to a greater exposure to enemy fire. Alleyways, balconies, rooftops, staircases, all of them could be used to set an ambush in what can quickly turn into a deadly maze. On top of that, being on foot also means that Kore tactical units will be much slower to arrest the suspects they're looking for. And if the raids take place at night, the streetlights of the favela are also cut off and spotlights are pointed at the advancing policemen in order to blind them. So from a tactical perspective, the most important is to break these barricades ASAP. That's why Kore has a specialized team of demolition guys. They often have to intervene to clear these barricades that are now filled with improvised explosive devices. This takes time and skill. The other reason to break open these gates is to allow the second wave of regular cops into the favela, which will then take control over the ground. Just to show how difficult these operations are, in 2021, during the raid on Jacarezinho, one Core operative was KIA as he exited the Caveron to remove one of the barricades. That's because the Bandidos added another layer of difficulty. 200 meters or so behind the set of barricades, they carved firing holes into the walls and fired from these concealed positions at the police tactical squads coming up the street or trying to break through the barricades. Fun fact, I taught my instructors the French word meurtrier to describe these firing slits and they like the direct Portuguese translation of it. I don't know, in English it would be like the bloody ones. As they push up the streets, tactical units are supported by sniper fire, whose job is to suppress exposed enemy combatants. Unlike in many movies, the snipers are not positioned on a rooftop hundreds of meters away. Once the tactical teams enter this urban jungle, the sniper needs to be able to see what's going on in order to properly support his team. That's why he has to be right there with his comrades. Snipers need to be able to fight in close quarters and maneuver in the tight streets. The heavy arsenal used by these factions means Kore and Bopi need weapons strong enough to counter these criminals or weapons that regular police officers do not have access to like AR-10s, M16s, M4 carbines, MP5s. Now according to phone intercepts, the bandits do not fear the fire from 9mm guns. Meanwhile, the 556 allows lighter magazines and thus more ammo can be used for suppressive fire, but it's really the 762 that is the favorite. Due to its greater firepower, it can penetrate brick walls, but also for the intimidating effect it has on the enemy. Okay, after looking at the situation with the barricades, you might ask, why not use the helicopters? Well, like we've seen in the introduction, it's complicated. 
On paper, Kore is equipped with four of them. For example, here you can see this Eli Brass AS350 B3 Ecureuil, right before takeoff, with our sniper friend Gabriel Lodge ready for combat. First of all, Gabriel told me that snipers do not actually fire from helicopters. The reason is simple. For a precise shot, the platform has to be stable. But that's impossible when they get flacked by heavy return fire. Here's another example of what happens when you fly too close from a favela. In reality, AKs are enough to deal significant damage to helicopters. So to avoid being fired at, Kore helicopters fly raising close to the favela buildings. And this tactic also has a significant effect on the morale of the criminals. However, Kore's helicopters will still hunt down gang members as their aerial operatives provide precise fire on exposed enemy gunmen. And I've been told they also use the helicopters to airdrop combat teams behind enemy lines. So at this point, you can see how complex it is to mount a mission. Now, how about we add some spices? During this presentation, I've also been shown how small groups of young men in arms operate and roam through the favelas. I've been told the average armed criminal is between 25 and 28 years old. And from what I could see, he's black on! And that's a big problem, and you'll see why in a moment. Essentially, many Brazilian activists will simplify the situation by only looking at race. When at the same time, many police officers and core operatives are also black or brown. In reality, regardless of how much melanin they have, we can see them holding military-grade weapons. And on top of that, they don't wear uniforms. Let's say one of them shoots at the police and empties his magazine, then drops the AK. What then? Is he considered a civilian or a combatant? Just like in Mexico, 90% of these weapons are made in America, often via third countries like Paraguay from Brazil's 7,000-kilometer border or simply through containers at the port. By the way, Delegado Fabricio Oliveira was recently featured in an article by Bloomberg titled Deadly New Trade in Frankenstein Guns Enabled by a Gap in U.S. Law, where they talk about this entire issue. In the past two years, Battalion Commander Fabricio proudly captured over 400 weapons straight out of the enemy's hands. Sometimes weapons even come to the airport. One time, thanks to a mall, the police managed to stop a plane filled with 60 rifles right in the middle of the airport. What the criminals did was to remove some weight from the heating compartment of the aircraft and replaced it with an equal weight of weapons. We're talking about 45 AK-47s, 14 Air-10s, and even 1.6 Sauer. Now, I've told you the spices would have their effect and now comes the first taboo aspect of this video. The close relationship between the criminal factions and the local civilian population. <laughs> For example, who sets up these barricades? It also often happens that entire buses are used to block the roads leading up to the favela, or when all the moto taxis suddenly swarm down the main road to block the police. In this video, you can see four operatives from Kore proceeding to the arrest of a suspect. That's when dozens of women and children arrive to harass and impede the actions of the police. And honestly, the operatives have a lot of patience because a lot of these criminals they arrest is for the eighth time and the judges keep giving them the lowest prison sentences and they're back on the street. Gabriel the sniper said there were times where he clearly saw an armed bandit in his line of sight but he held fire because there were civilians nearby. Also most of these guys are so skinny that if he did fire the bullet would pass right through and could hit someone behind. So in that case he doesn't take the shot and simply lets them escape. All these stratagems used by the criminals are meant to slow down the advance of the police tactical units. Long enough for the criminals to escape with all their weapons and substance. As you can see in this video, an entire squad of 15 heavily armed guys is on the move. They will throw down homemade grenades and fire their guns blindly over the corners. According to Kore operatives, that's a big problem. By doing so, the bandits fire from a concealed position. And although accuracy is poor, it will force the operatives to take cover. But as you can imagine, uh, there will be a lot of collateral damage. And from there, the bandits vanish into the wilderness. And once the police is gone, eventually, they will come back. That's why there's one squad of specialists going for the frontal penetration, and the regulars will be positioned on the flanks to cover the back door and cover some axes of retreat that could be used by the bandits and essentially ambush them. When Cody needs more muscle, they call all their teams, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta, plus all the regulars. 
and when necessary they can even push side by side with their sister unit of the military police, Bopi. After this very eye-opening presentation, I spent some time with what I call the sappers of the battalion. They showed me all the types of homemade grenades used by the criminals and all of this built with civilian materials. Through hefty bribes, they can get their hands on industrial leftovers and construction explosives. I've even been shown all the rocket launchers that Kore has captured over the years. While some of these explosives are used to defend their home turf, others are meant for the away game, whether it's attacks on enemy factions or targeting financial institutions. In 2022, 74 robberies of financial institutions were reported in the Brazilian state of Rio de Janeiro. For these special commando missions, the gangs recruit explosive specialists in order to break open the bank vaults. And if these guys get arrested, they simply raise up their hands. And since they are unarmed, the judge will only give them six months in prison at most. But I've been told it's definitely worth the money they earned from the job. As you can see, the problem is complicated. In the last 25 years, Kore operatives suffered 10 losses three KIA and seven others of duty. Honestly, that's a recurrent problem in Latin America. In this article, you can see how 70% of the police officers that fell in Rio de Janeiro were also of duty. Of course, that's when they're the most vulnerable. They can get followed and who knows? And that's what happened to one of the guys from Kore. He was attacked by five gunmen that were trying to rob his car. The operative pulled out his gun and managed to tank one of the assailants down. But two others came from the rear and um, that's when he went down. That's when I asked them, why not send the army inside the favelas? Well, that's because the Brazilian army is already often called to intervene in these favelas. As you can see in this article, in 2014, 2,700 soldiers from the armed forces take over occupation of 15 communities. Same thing in 2018. Federal intervention in Rio, the army on the streets. As opposed to the police, the army is more appreciated and respected by the locals. But every time it's just a show of force. It doesn't actually solve the problem. The soldiers sent there they didn't know what their mission was. And they're simply not trained for these peacekeeping missions. The dark secret of this war with no name is the following. In Brazil, every year 5-6% to 6 of young men are selected at random for military service. For financial reasons, most of the ones that remain in the military after conscription come from the favelas. After years of service, once they're out of the Brazilian armed forces, they return to the favelas and can't find a proper job. So many end up getting hired by the criminal factions. Check out this article. In Rio, ex-soldiers teach army tactics to factions. Former paratroopers and former marines receive 600 to 1000 USD per hour of class. That's a month of salary in an hour. And they don't necessarily work as guns for hire, but more like specialists. These ex-soldiers become explosive experts. They're the ones that build these grenades and IDs. They do the maintenance for all the weapons. And of course, they teach the latest military tactics. While clearing a favela, it happens that Kore operatives come face to face with guys they knew from their years in the army. The last part of the video will have to do with what I think is the core problem of all this. The informational war. Upsided death tolls have become a common occurrence in real raids, leading critics to allege excessive force or even summary executions by the police. After these police operations, activists arrive and will start denouncing the violent methods used by the police. And I don't know if they're just naive or if some of them are just paid by the factions. Thus the term narco-activists. Their role is to turn public opinion and Brazil's institutions against the law enforcement. They write tons of articles omitting to say that the victims of these police raids were gang members or they often whitewash these criminals. Like this one where they state martial arts lost a young man who dreamed of UFC without mentioning that he fell with a weapon in his hand. Or like this one, where they crop the picture so that we don't see the guy holding a gun. Or in this one, where they speak of a hardworking and good man that fell to the police, showing the picture of an old man, when in reality the suspect constantly posted pictures of himself holding weapons. Kore even invited some of these activists to join them on a patrol to see what it's like from the perspective of the police. But all of them said no. 
That's the type of videos you can find on YouTube about Rio de Janeiro and their police operations. For example, in this one, at least 25 KIA in Rio de Janeiro's deadliest favela raid. Okay, but how many of them had fully loaded AK-47s pointing at the police? These activists will twist facts to fit inside their ideology and will claim that the police specifically target poor black communities. Ah, oh, because of racism. We hear the same narrative everywhere. Meanwhile, only some political candidates will be allowed to campaign inside the favelas. In the end, it's all about votes and power, not empathy. Because of the influence of these narco-activists, every one of these deaths will be considered a murder and will be investigated. And some operatives can end up behind bars. Their job is dangerous enough, now they're facing a two-front war. How is it fair that operatives have less than a second to make a life or death decision, but judges get three years to evaluate every one of their actions? One day, Kore did a special boot camp for judges. Heavy military type drills, physically demanding, followed by a practical exercise in this training favela they custom built in the police station, which I'm lucky enough to have been able to visit. Under extreme stress, one of the judges quickly turned the corner and fired at a prop holding a drill, and another accidentally shot a prop holding an umbrella. And the judge complained that he didn't have enough time to assess the situation. <laughs> Before leaving the police headquarters, Gabriel told me that it breaks his heart to see so many people just smoke trees and consume various substances, as if they were oblivious that all the money goes directly into the hands of the criminals, makes them richer, allows them to buy more weapons and to bribe their way through society. These people are literally handing over their money to the people making their lives miserable. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.